John Semmingson with Peak Demand, a managing partner. We conduct technical and executive search uh, across the renewable space. Awesome, John. Thanks so much for making time to join us on the Heavy Podcast. Before, I want to spend some time talking about your current role in, in Peak Demand, what you guys are building there. But before we do that, give us a thumbnail version of your career to date. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I started my career in recruiting back in 2007, focused in, in energy. And at that time, we were working primarily in the power and gas markets, placing salespeople in, in deregulated markets, so out in ERCOT in the Northeast, as well as energy efficiency. Um, you know, the recruiting is kind of a, a weird industry, but my, uh, my learning curve was more accelerated than it was supposed to be. And after about four months, I was shifted into what, what we call a, a full uh, 360 account executive. So with, with very little experience was responsible for driving new business and uh, building relationships with key executives across the space and um, kind of one of those sink or swim situations very early on. And uh, luckily, uh, I was able to swim and uh, been, been moving along since. Oh, that's super exciting. And thanks for sharing a little bit about that background. Very diverse. Congrats on all the success. Uh, so tell us a little bit more about Impact Demand. How did that all come about and what are you guys trying to accomplish? Yeah. So it, it was probably around 2009 that that kind of made a, a very focused shift from more of what I would just describe as traditional power generation into the renewable space. Um, and at the time, it was actually one of our clients on the energy efficiency side, Chevron Energy Solutions, that was starting to do a bunch of renewables. They were really kind of ahead of the time uh, at that moment. And they kind of drug us into the solar space. I very quickly fell in love and made a, a very hard shift. So by around 2010, we had pretty much moved away from all of the traditional uh, power generation stuff and was focused exclusively in solar and now energy storage and, and EVs. Um, so I, I was able to take over the company in about 2015. It used to be called Management Recruiters of Sacramento. We're, we're part of the MRI network. And uh, we rebranded to peak demand to kind of emphasize our focus in the renewable space. And um, so now we are a, a small but mighty team that, that are recruiting really all across the renewable space, helping people take the next steps in their careers and, and really helping organizations find the critical talent they need to grow. And, and so we, we love working in renewables. We absolutely are passionate about the transition to clean energy and just love being part of this, this network. Well, that's very exciting and very unique space. You know, as they say, um, the, the riches are in the niches. You know, <laughs> at the end of the day, it's a um, very interesting space. And I, I'm pretty sure that's been on quite a rise, especially the last several years with, you know, the, the clean energy, the energy storage. I think a lot of those are very exciting trends, at least from from investment perspective. I've been researching that a little bit. But I'm sure you your knowledge and depth in that is a lot is you know is much deeper. So share with us any of the trends, and you know anything that's happening in the market that you are very excited about. Yeah, and I guess there's I could talk a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of trends in the renewable space specifically, and then you know broader trends across the the market from a hiring perspective. Um, you know, from from a renewables perspective, uh, the market's just on fire. Uh, I, I think that. Like, like everyone in the early days of the pandemic, there was a, a big pause, especially for a lot of the residential side of the market when you're having to go door to door selling solar or going on somebody's roof. Um, but, it, you know, really, the industry was very resilient and moved very quickly. And uh, 2020 ended up being a fantastic year. And, and I would say that probably around the beginning of end of quarter three, beginning of quarter four last year is when we really started seeing hiring pick up. Uh, in, in a major way. And that's just continued through this year. Uh, the reality is that there is so much growth happening in the renewable space that there's just more opportunity in hiring going on than there are uh, qualified and, and kind of talented individuals with experience to, to fill all the roles out there. So we're seeing a tremendous amount of growth and you know, really organizations that are having to get a little more creative about how they go about hiring. And, you know, we're seeing that really not just in renewables, but as I talk with other leaders within uh, recruiting organizations in almost every industry, we're hearing similar stories, uh, you know, as the world is starting to open back up and the economy's, you know, moving again, uh, it's becoming very, very difficult to find people for almost every segment of the market right now. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, those are definitely exciting trends. And at the same time, coming out of pandemic, it's very interesting to observe from a talent acquisition perspective, how, you know, just overall direction of the market in terms of that war for talent, that war on retention. And now we've been hearing a lot of terms such as, you know, the great resignation move, uh, things like that. So curious yeah. to get your thoughts from that perspective. Um, but overall, as we talk about you know, the future of work and, you know, the, you know, emergence of kind of the contingent worker, the, the freelancer, the gig workers, shifting the dynamics and just overall workforce trends. How do you think about future of work in general? What are your thoughts there? And what do you think is next from that perspective? Yeah. Um, the future of work is, is changing, as you know. And, you know, you talk about the, the great resignation. I, it's, it's interesting to see all this stuff happening. You know, I was talking last night. I got a phone call from uh, a leader for a company I know very, very well that, you know, they've had like a 97% retention rate for their key leaders over the last four years. And in the last six months, they've lost, uh, I think it was something like uh, 35% of their key staff that has been poached by other organizations. And it's not like their company has changed dramatically, but um, people are coming in and it's kind of like the housing market right now. I don't, I don't know where it is in, in your neck of the woods, but out here in California, it's just, it's insane. People are, are buying houses without even looking at them and the prices are just skyrocketing. And we're starting to see it in hiring. I mean, people are throwing ridiculous amounts of money in some cases and, uh, or organizations just are, are really having a difficult time retaining people in, in some instances. We're hearing stories of people getting literally double or, or triple their uh, existing salary to come and make a jump to some of these startups. And um, it's very difficult for organizations to compete. So, but to, to answer your question and what, what changes in the world of work in the future, um, you know, we, we look at the market in kind of one or two buckets. It's either uh, a candidate driven market or uh, a company driven market is, is what tends to happen. And very, very f seldomly do they kind of balance out with one another so that it's you know, perfect supply and demand curve. We're definitely in what we call a candidate driven market right now. There's just more opportunity than there are people. And so candidates really are driving the bus in many ways. They're, they can be more selective. And, you know, one of the key things that we're seeing, people want to know about remote work and flexibility. And as an organization, if the expectation is for someone to be in the office every day, 40 hours a week, you're at a significant disadvantage already. Some roles obviously are less uh, likely to be successful fully remote. I think that, you know, kind of that hybrid option is what's going to be uh, the best option for, for most opportunities in the future. But, uh, you know, people being in the office a couple of days a week, giving them the flexibility to take care of their business, that's really where I think this is going for, for most organizations. Right. And, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Continue your thought. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you got to interrupt me or I'll just keep going. Yeah. The, other, the other major thing that we're seeing is just that focus on, on diversity and inclusion. And we're having people ask us very early on, how, are, how is your, this organization handling diversity? What does the executive team makeup look like? And those just weren't questions that we were hearing from people three years ago. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. From the DI perspective is definitely... Um, has been in the spotlight, especially, you know, the last few years, that, as we've seen, and I would imagine the same cases in, you know, at the board level, at the executive level, from that standpoint. Um, so as you, as you partner with both sides, you work with the hiring organization, represent the hiring managers, and then you also, work, you know, on the other side of the spectrum, you work with the candidates, with the executives, uh, with the job seekers. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about the the strategy to prepare the both sides for that first interview, because, you know, interviewing is such a, you know, I'm yet to meet anybody who's really good at interviewing. It's, it's very difficult. It's a combination of art and science. It's hard to master. It's an ongoing learning journey. So what are your thoughts in terms of prepping both sides, setting the right expectations and really, you know, increasing your batting average when it comes to the interviews? Yeah, well, I, I think setting the right expectations is a, a big part of it. And, you know, the, the part of the world that we see from an interview perspective is a little bit different than uh, maybe if you're not working with an executive search firm and you're going direct or applying online, because we, we spend a lot of time on the front end, really trying to understand 
from, from a company's perspective, what are you really looking for? What are going to be the key drivers for success? And as an organization, what do you have to offer in terms of career path and growth? And what are the key things that, that we know individuals are going to be interested in? And then we do the same thing when we're talking to candidates in the market. It's what are your real motivations? Why would you really consider leaving your existing job? And, and we end up screening a lot out that maybe wouldn't go well on a first interview. We screen it out ahead of time. So if, if, you're, if what you're looking for in your career path isn't going to be matched well with the opportunities we're working on, we just don't want to waste anybody's time. So really setting those expectations up early on is, is super critical for us. But you know, really, I think for a lot of individuals that are walking into the first interview, it, it's, it's making sure that you have a, a way to kind of tell your story in a compelling way that's relatively concise and can get the person on the other end to understand the value you bring to that role. And that comes from understanding the company, understanding what it is they're looking to do, and really understanding the role so that you can, uh, you know, really come in and, and tell a compelling story. Because at the end of the day, the first interview is just trying to get them interested enough to go to the second interview. Right, absolutely. No, and it's, it, I love some of these strategies that you're talking about seem so, you know, simple, oftentimes overlooked, you know, really to be able to create that environment that it's a two way street conversation at the end of the day, uh, both for the candidate as well to interview you as much as you're interviewing them as a hiring manager um, and understand, you know, the dynamics of the leadership style, the culture that's being fostered within the organization. So a lot of those variables are very interesting from, from that standpoint, so it makes sense. And just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy, right? It, it, it sounds simple, but it, does, it's, it's, it can be very hard to execute that properly. Right, 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 no, absolutely. Um, when, we, when we talk about innovation and helping organizations, you know, build and foster that culture innovation through exceptional candidates, you being on kind of the, the top level with the executives where it starts actually from, you know, top to bottom from the walking the walk perspective and, you know, you know, identifying some of the strategies to build that culture of innovation. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, from that standpoint, how do you make sure that as you partner with an organization, you do that intake and you try to understand their environment and then you, you, you take that information and apply that in your search and try to identify candidates that would be a perfect match for that. I would imagine that's not an easy uh, task to accomplish. So talk to us a little bit about kind of your practical recommendations in that space. Well, you know, there's, there's no such thing as a perfect fit, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, yeah. Nothing's ever perfect. But, you know, to your point, I think that that culture of innovation, it, it it either exists or it doesn't. And a lot of companies talk about it, but don't really execute on it. They, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And you can, it, it takes time and energy to really figure out, do, do they have the ability to really innovate? Because it's not only do you have to uh, have a process to find and then ultimately hire really good talent to innovate, you have to be giving them a, a culture where you're going to allow them to fail and to make mistakes and to, um, you know, really spread their wings. And, and some organizations are better at that than others. Um, and, and, you know, unfortunately, there's not necessarily just three questions you can ask somebody. It, it comes from long-term relationships and understanding your market and the organizations and the individuals within it uh, to be able to determine do they really understand this and are they really committed to it or is it more of a tagline? But I think the, the organizations that, that are best at it, they are very open-minded. They um, really do a good job of fostering that, that culture. They allow people a lot of rope and a lot of room to run and to make mistakes, uh, of course, within boundaries. And, and those are the companies that are really innovating, in, at least in our market. Right, right, right. No, absolutely. And, you know, the just innovation in general is such a interesting topic where it carries that, you know, perception of innovation being something grandiose and, and disrupting where uh, disruptive. And at the same time, you know, there's opportunities to treat innovation from a much smaller scale and perspective through these experiments and being able to identify small areas for opportunity to improve maybe a small process internally. So that's, you know, definitely resonates with everything you're talking about. 
um, as we, you know, as, as you collaborate with, with the executives in the unique space of renewables and clean energy, uh, just overall, what are some of the in-demand skill sets that you're seeing out there that the companies demand yet is very, very challenging to find? Yeah, I think the, the fastest growing segment in terms of hiring right now, well, there's a lot of them, but the one that's the hardest to find, at least for us, is, is energy storage. There is so much happening in the storage space from, you know, individuals that, that come from a chemistry background or a product background that can actually help design the next generation of battery technology or put it together in a systemized product. Um, those skill sets are incredibly difficult to find. And, and there's just a lot of growth in that market, as well as individuals that, that can help the, the business models really for. Uh, distributed generation, so kind of commercial and residential energy storage, as well as these big utility scale energy storage projects, the, the market is so dynamic and the financial drivers and the market drivers for them are kind of evolving and changing. So individuals that, that understand that process, uh, either from a technical perspective and can actually design these things and make sure that they can integrate with the grid properly, uh, as well as understand the financing and the mechanics behind how to make them pencil and bring them to market. Uh, these are some of the, the hottest skill sets and hardest to find people right now. But the reality is, if you look over the last three or four years, one of the fastest growing jobs in the entire U.S. economy has been solar installers. And so it may not be the most glamorous or, or technical uh, innovation, but just getting people that can go out and build these power plants, uh, it's one of, the, one of the hottest jobs in the country right now. Right. No, absolutely. The energy storage is such a unique space and definitely very interesting. I've been observing that, you know, with obviously with, with Tesla being at the forefront with a lot of the news that's been happening. I think it's uh, it's very interesting how things will play out, especially technology emerging uh, from from that space. Um, so when, you know, you've you've been in, in talent acquisition and, you know, for quite some time in terms of the industry evolving or just how the industry had changed pre-pandemic versus the post-pandemic, what are the different shifts are you observing in the industry or where do you see this going next? You know, the... If the, you had the crystal ball. <laughs> yeah, of course. And every time I predict something, everything changes anyway. So I, you know, the, the, the way that things changed, you know, when the pandemic happened and the speed at which it transitioned was pretty phenomenal. Um, some organizations had already been doing Zoom interviews and these kind of calls, but very few companies last February were, you know, really hiring very senior level executives without ever meeting them. Uh, I mean, we would have a, a process every once in a while where maybe you wouldn't meet your new hire, but it was it was more of the exception than the rule. And, you know, during the pandemic, we placed a CEO of a very large renewable energy developer and uh, they, they never met each other. Right, they couldn't travel. This was a, a, a very senior level role that uh, they they had some familiarity with each other, which made it a little bit easier. But um, very uncommon to see, you know, that kind of a role being hired without people meeting in person. And so that that was a key shift. And some organizations embraced it earlier than others. And um, you know, frankly, there was a couple of companies that last March and April, when things were a little bit uh, hairy and very uncertain. There were a few organizations that we knew well that really leaned into it and took the opportunity to hire some amazing people when everybody else was kind of pausing and trying to figure out what was going on. So I, I don't know if post-pandemic that will continue at the same rate. I do think there's value in meeting people in person and there's a certain amount of uh, interaction that's valuable to happen. But I think you'll, you'll see a lot more of that interview process happen remotely. And I think that's a good thing. You know, people don't need to take four days off of work to, to meet everybody over and over again in a process. It's just silly. So I, I think that is a, a tremendous change that will be positive moving forward. Um, and, and just the entire notion around, you know, work from home and flexibility of work. Uh, those are going to be the two biggest changes, I think, moving forward. Right, right, right. No, that's very interesting. And I, uh, every every episode, I tell each one of my guests that I love doing a follow up uh, recording in about a year uh -huh. and revisit the conversation we've had, you know, previously a year ago to see how much we've discussed still applies and if that makes sense. So I'm definitely looking forward to do that 
uh, with you as well in terms of some of these predictions, which is very interesting. Um, when it comes to retention, obviously, you know, it, as you stated, it's very much so candidate driven um, market with, you know, organizations now having the opportunity to recruit on a global scale virtually, but also competition 10 X through yeah. that period as well. Um, what are your thoughts on, on winning that war on retention? How can companies better, more efficiently, you know, proactively almost create an environment for, for, for that retention? Well, I think that's key is being proactive, right? If you're waiting until one of your key executives comes to the table and says, hey, I have a counter offer for 30% more, you've already lost, right? Um, uh, generally speaking, we advise people not to make counter offers, but that's a different conversation. I think it's, you know, really building that culture. Uh, some organizations have been guilty in the past of really viewing folks as, as a number, and they view them as, as interchangeable pieces. And if, if that's the way you treat your organization, you're going to have a retention problem. People have a ton of options. So it's just a mind shift. I think if you've built a solid culture and you've got a really good team and people are working together and they feel empowered and you've built that kind of culture of innovation that we were talking about earlier, uh, but you also have to understand the market dynamics. And I think you need to be assuming that your top performers are being targeted by other organizations. And you should be having regular conversations with them about how are things going? What can we be doing What, what from a growth perspective? Just you know, checking in with your people. And it can't be on an annual basis. It's too long. I think you need to be having these conversations with your people on a quarterly basis. And you need to be evaluating uh, whether or not you can be increasing their compensation and what other drivers are going to be potentially leading people away and just be very, very proactive with it. And also have some secession planning in place so that if you do lose a key person, you've got somebody else that's ready to step up because uh, if, if you're left scrambling at the last minute without any backup, it's very, very challenging. Right, right, right. Absolutely. No, and it's such a broad space, especially when it comes to just overall company culture that fosters, you know, certain behavior and laying that foundation for, you know, top performers to be recognized to continuously be challenged while being, you know, properly compensated. Uh, I think it's, you know, there's so many ingredients to that particular formula that's uh, very, very, very difficult to, to master as well. We, we see a lot of companies that end up being, uh, uh, you know, penny wise and pound foolish and, uh, you know, bonus time comes around and they find reasons not to give people the full bonus or they, you know, they, they reallocate territories on salespeople and they leave. And, uh, you know, there's, there's so many little things that companies do trying to, to save a dollar here and there, and they don't necessarily see the bigger picture that th these cost saving maneuvers are going to end up costing you a lot in the long run. Right, right, right. No, absolutely. That makes perfect sense. Um, and John, from standpoint of your content diet, uh, what are the different sources that you utilize on daily basis to keep yourself educated ahead of the curve? Uh, share with us those. Yeah, you know, I probably spend more time than I should uh, digesting media and, and just trying to stay up on top of the market. Um, you know, very fortunate as part of the MRI network that they have a ton of great information for us around just trends in the recruiting and the hiring space in general. So uh, from a recruiting and a training perspective, they do a wonderful job at the corporate level. From an industry perspective, um, it, it used to be green tech media. Now it's uh, Canary Media is it continues to be my go to for the majority of, of the news and content I read. Uh, Solar Wake Up is another one every morning in, in my inbox where I, I can digest a lot. Um, there's so many great sources now uh, where, where to find the content. Um, LinkedIn, of course, is another one where I, I just digest a ton of news and information. Um, I'm active on Twitter. I don't post on there very much. But for someone like me with an attention span of a gnat to be able to just thumb through and see what's going on really, really quickly, I'm, I'm on there quite a bit as well. Right, right, right. No, that's very interesting with so much information being thrown at us. Uh, I'm always interested in hearing people's strategies. How do, how, do, how, do, how do you control that flow and what you let your mind be exposed to? You know, I use, um, it's, it's um, I think it's Buffer. No, Deliver It. And uh, it's, it's just a news aggregation source. So I have five or six 
uh, websites that I follow and all the news goes in there and I try to check it in the morning or on Friday and just filter through all the different news reports. And if I block it out in like a 20 minute segment, I can usually run through a pretty good amount of it. Uh, otherwise, you know, if you're just doing it throughout the day, before you know it, you've, you've wasted your whole day away just reading the news. Right, 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 absolutely. Last but not least, in terms of books, what, what are you currently reading? And is there a book that you always recommend to others and why is that? Oh boy. Um, I would say the two that I read most recently were uh, Sales Truth by Mike Weinberg. If you're generally in sales business development, uh, Mike is probably the best. Uh, I love all of his stuff, but Sales Truth was his most recent. Uh, and then the, the other one I read recently was um, Chris Voss. What was it? Um, Never Split the Difference. Oh, yeah, yeah, the negotiation one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, love that book. So I think those are, are both great ones that I would recommend to anybody. Oh, those are great recommendations. Uh, and for our listeners, we'll make those available in the show notes. Uh, John, can't thank you enough for your time today. Very short and insightful conversation. I personally learned quite a bit. We're going to stay in touch. And like I mentioned, we'll do another episode in the year and see what has changed. Wonderful. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. It was great.